This is our third session on Philippians 2, 9 to 11, and I want to linger with you over the way Paul fleshes out the exaltation of Jesus after his resurrection. So we ask you, Father, the glorious one to whom everything was moving in this text, that you would reveal to us what you inspired the Apostle Paul to reveal to us concerning the glory of Jesus Christ and its implication for our lives. I ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, and that therefore is, remember, going back to uh, chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 on the humiliation of Jesus from heaven down to the cross because he obediently humbled himself. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So you, you stare at a text and you stare at a text and You see various things in various sequences, and you stand back and you try to make sense. So one of the things I saw was uh, every name, every knee, every tongue. And then I paused and thought, is that a sequence of three? And I thought, well, not quite, because... When he says he gave him a name that is above every name, it's followed by so that. And the so that follows from the name of Jesus being above every name and results in, isn't that a result or a purpose? A purpose is simply a result with a purposer. And here's the purposer who right there is designing. God is doing this so that. This will happen. So he's, he's bestowing a name, a character, a being, a dignity, a, a glory, an honor, a power, a wisdom on Jesus in his new uh, God-man resurrection state that never existed before, that name above every name. So there's a a dignity and an honor, a superiority to Jesus, the God-man, now risen from the dead, over every name with a result or a purpose. And there are two of them. One, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every knee would be Physical submission and secondly, second result, every tongue confess that this Jesus is Lord. So every knee goes down and every tongue puts Jesus Christ up to lordship so this is this would be verbal submission so the point of god giving the greatest name to the god man jesus christ is so that there would be total physical submission total verbal Submission, when I say total, that's coming from another observation. Every knee should bow. Really? Every? Yes. In heaven, on earth, under the earth. Heavenly beings, earthly beings, under earthly beings. And wouldn't you agree that the the point of those three is not perhaps necessarily to isolate angels, man, and demons, because they're probably 
human souls in heaven, and under the earth is the realm of the dead humans in burial or in Sheol. And so my guess is what he's trying to say with heaven and earth and under earth is totality. Totality of submission. Nowhere, nowhere in the universe is there any remaining unsubdued powers. Jesus will one day bring everything to absolute physical, verbal, total submission, which raises the question, doesn't it, about whether this confession here and this bowing here are saving. Is this salvation? Is this teaching universalism, meaning everybody will be saved in the end? Not if there's coherence in Paul, because Paul elsewhere teaches that people are lost in the end. But there are demonic bowings that are not saving. For example, here's Mark 3.11. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, Jesus, they fell down, they bowed before him and cried out, you're the son of God. But they remained in demonic opposition to Jesus. So this bowing here is a constrained bowing and that's what I assume goes on here as well among those who will not yield in their hearts. What about this word confess? That could be saving confession. Could it be anything else? Well, here's a usage of it. You can't see this in English so well. Luke 22 they were glad, the Pharisees were glad and, argued, and agreed to give Judas money. So he, and here's that word, exomologeo, he confessed, he agreed, he consented. And I'm pointing out that simply so that you could see that this could mean simply consent in an external way to the lordship of Jesus because he has superior power over every name. So I don't think we can infer from this text that everybody's going to be saved. Everybody will simply have to submit. I would think Revelation 5.13 is a picture of this. I heard every creature in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them. Now, when you say in the sea, <laughs> that's fish. I heard every creature, angels, and people on earth, and animals, and under the earth, demons, and in the sea, fish, and all that is in them, saying, yeah, we got talking animals here, which is simply a way of saying every, every inch of this universe, animate, inanimate, intelligent, unintelligent, are going to say with whatever language God gives them to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And some of them are going to love what they're saying and delight in it, and some are going to be fish and will simply yield in their inanimate form to this kind of cry. And some are going to be demonic and going to have to say it, even though they hate what they say. Let me return to the question now, having seen all that submission, all that rule of Jesus to this therefore. Therefore. What are we to make of all of that for us? What, what implication does it have for us? Well, let me suggest this. This, therefore, remember, is a reward 
for the mind of Christ, have this mind in yourselves, which is in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself. He took the form of a servant. He became in the likeness of men. He was found in human form. He humbled himself. He became obedient even to death, the worst death on the cross. In other words, what's going on here is Jesus is going from glory to as low as he can go, and the bottom is the cross, from glory to shame and suffering. And then, with this therefore, he is being rewarded to greater glory. Because the God-man is now being raised to where the God-man had never been before. The Son of God had been in his original eternal glory, but now it's Jesus Christ who is risen to greater glory, and that is a consequence of his obedience. And the argument is, you, you Philippians now, don't do anything from selfish ambition and conceit, but you in humility, just like he humbled himself. You in humility count others more significant, like he counted us sinners more significant in coming for us, even though we didn't deserve it. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, like Jesus didn't look to his own interests merely. He looked to our interests. So the whole point is you have this mind, which Jesus had, and the motivation to help us go low down to suffering and shame is the promise that we will be with Jesus in this wonderful exaltation. So that's the, that this is intended to lead to our obedience in two, three, and four with the mind of Christ. You see this here in Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. So what he inherits in his glory, we inherit provided we suffer with him. Are we willing to be humble with him and go down low with him in order that we may be glorified with him? This, therefore, is the glorification of Jesus, and it is ours if we have the mind of Christ and suffer with him. And one other implication, when that is seen to be true, when, when he has that kind of exaltation and authority, then we're able, in a lowly, servant, suffering, sacrificial demeanor, to obey the Great Commission. Jesus came and said to them, all authority. That's Philippians 2, 9 to 11. Every, I'm above every name. All, all knees are bowing to me. All tongues are confessing to me. I have all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. I'll be with you to the end of the age. So you can see how this, this massive exaltation of Jesus combined with that therefore and combined with this beautiful description in 2, 3 through 8 of what the mind of Christ is supposed to be. Have this mind. You can see how practical it is. If we could be gripped by the exaltation of Jesus and our participation in it through going humble and serving others like he did. Oh, what freedom and love we would enjoy.